Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the Elizabeth Short case. She is also known as the Black Dahlia. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So here I'll look at the background of Elizabeth Short, then move to the timeline of the crime, then look at the mental health and personality factors. Starting with the background, Elizabeth Short was born on July 29, 1924 in Boston, Massachusetts. Six years later, her father's car was found on a bridge. Her mother believed that her father had jumped into a river to his death. In 1942, Short's mother received a letter from her father indicating that he had moved to California to start a new life. Short went to live with her father in California. They had some difficulties with one another, and eventually he kicked her out of his residence. She stayed in the area, though. She was arrested for underage drinking in September of 1943 at age 19, but she was never convicted. So the police arrested her, took her picture, and then let her go. The police had actually arranged for her to go to Massachusetts, but she went to Florida instead. When she was there, she accepted a marriage proposal from a major in the Air Force, but he was killed in action in 1945. Short moved back to California in July of 1946. She worked as a waitress and tried to find work as an actress. It appears as though she never actually did work as an actress. She started dating a 25-year-old married man named Robert Manley. Robert Manley denied that his relationship with Elizabeth Short was sexual in nature. Apparently, they just spent time in hotel rooms together, but one slept on the bed and the other slept in a chair. He must have just read the book titled How to Tell Lies That Are 100% Transparent. Now moving to the timeline, we go to January 8, 1947. Robert Manley picks up Short so they can spend time together. That's all they were doing, just hanging out as friends. She was 22 years old at this time. The next day, January 9, Manley drops Short off at the Biltmore Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. Short's sister was visiting from Massachusetts, and Short was supposed to meet her there. Witnesses remembered seeing Short using a phone in the lobby of the hotel. Now moving to January 15, 1947, Los Angeles resident Betty Bursinger was pushing her three-year-old daughter in a stroller. Just before 11 a.m., she came upon what she believed were two pieces of a store mannequin. Soon after that, she realized it was a naked body, and she made her way to a nearby residence to call the police. The body was that of Elizabeth Short. It was completely severed at the waist, and the blood had been drained out, so the body was in two parts. The body had a number of other deep cuts, including cuts from the ears to the corners of the mouth. The body was cold. There was a sack of concrete with blood spots on it nearby. There was a blood spot on the sidewalk and a heel print in the driveway nearby. The body appeared to have been washed and posed. It was believed that she was killed late on January 14 or early on January 15. Initially, the cause of death was thought to be strangulation, but later it was attributed to cerebral hemorrhage. The press nicknamed Short the Black Dahlia. This is how the case has been known since. Interestingly, for something so straightforward as assigning a nickname, there's a lot of debate over how exactly they came up with the name. The leading theory is that the name was based off the 1946 murder mystery movie, The Blue Dahlia, combined with the fact that Short had black hair and witnesses reported that she wore black garments. I think in looking at the different theories, that one actually makes the most sense. Moving to January 23, an editor at the newspaper, The Examiner, received a call from an individual who took responsibility for the murder. The individual said that some souvenirs would be arriving in the mail. This would prove that he was actually the killer. On the next day, an envelope arrived that contained photographs, business cards, a piece of paper with names written on it, an address book with the name Mark Hansen on the cover, and a birth certificate belonging to Short. The envelope had been cleaned with gasoline. The police were not able to get any usable fingerprints. A shoe and a handbag thought to belong to Short were located in an alley near where the body was found. 
These items had also been cleaned with gasoline. No fingerprints were on them. Later, the police determined the items did belong to Short. On January 26, a second letter was received by that newspaper. The killer said that they would turn themselves in on January 29, and they specified a location. The police were there waiting for them, but they never showed up. Another letter arrived indicating that the killer had changed their mind. They felt as though they weren't being given a square deal, and they said the killing was justified. Letters were received by several newspapers over the next few days. Moving to March 14, 1947, a note was found on a pile of men's clothing near the edge of the ocean. It appeared as though it was written by somebody trying to claim to be the killer. It indicated that the writer of the note had waited for the police to capture them. The writer was a coward, and the writer thought that this was the best way out, suggesting that they jumped in the ocean and therefore caused their own death. Mark Hansen, Robert Manley, and over 150 other men were interviewed by the police. Many people also confessed to this crime. I'll talk more about that later. The murder remains unsolved. There were dozens of decent suspects. One of the better suspects was a man named George Hodel. He was a physician who was accused by his son. His son was a Los Angeles homicide detective named Steve Hodel. Now, the son accused his father, George, of not only killing Elizabeth Short, but several other women. Steve Hodell also said his father was the Zodiac Killer. Now, George Hodell was the suspect in the death of his secretary. And again, he was a physician, and considering that the body was found in two parts, he was a good suspect. He was investigated for some time, and later we would see a transcript of a recorded conversation where he essentially said that if he did commit the murder, no one could prove it now. He also noted that no one could talk to his secretary because she was dead. This is an unusual statement, but it's hard to know if it's meaningful without context. Somebody could have asked him if he was the murderer, and that answer, again, a little bit off, but it doesn't really mean he was guilty. Another suspect I'll mention is Leslie Dillon. Dillon was a mortician's assistant and a bellhop. He revealed a lot of information about the case when he was being interviewed by the police, and he claimed to know who the killer was. The police followed up on the name that he gave them, Jeff Connors, they believed that Jeff's real name was Artie Lane, but nothing came of that investigation. The police violated Dillon's constitutional rights, and eventually he sued the city. The behavior of the police led to a 1949 grand jury investigation into a potential police cover-up. I actually think that Leslie Dillon was the best suspect of all the ones I read about. But of course, once the police violated his rights, that was it. It was going to be very difficult after that to charge him, and even more difficult to get a conviction. It's actually frightening how many people were fairly good suspects in this murder. In cases like this where there is little evidence, the number of suspects becomes staggering, similar to the Zodiac Killer or the Dan Cooper case, also known as the D.B. Cooper case. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors, I'll start with the killer. In 1947, it really wasn't difficult to get away with a crime like this, but the police did solve a number of murders, so there was still a great deal of risk involved from the standpoint of a murder. This killer was almost certainly male. It's likely that he knew Elizabeth Short. He had her birth certificate, and a lot of times these crimes are committed by somebody who knows the victim. The crime itself indicates rage and a desire to dominate. The person who contacted the newspaper was probably the killer. He did have access to her personal belongings, after all. What I find interesting here is that the killer's behavior really pulls in two separate directions. One direction makes it look like he wanted to get away with the crime. He dumped the victim's body in a different place from where the murder took place. He was careful not to leave usable fingerprints or much else in the way of evidence that could be linked to him. The other direction makes it appear as though he was not risk-averse. He severed the body into two parts. Not a useful strategy from the point of view of trying to escape arrest. It's unnecessary. He spent time posing the body at the dump site in view of the public. Also unnecessary and something that exposes him to more risk. And of course, we see the phone calls and the letters introducing even more risk. So he took a lot of chances. It's not known if this individual killed before or after he committed this murder. But based on this one murder, his personality profile would likely be similar to that of a serial killer. 
So we see mid-range openness to experience and conscientiousness and low extroversion agreeableness and neuroticism. Looking at Elizabeth Short, we don't really know a lot about her. I would probably say she would be high in openness to experience. She had dreams of becoming an actress and she moved quite a bit. So she appreciated art and she was adventurous. I would say low conscientiousness. She was drinking underage and spending time with a married man. Her level of extroversion was probably high. She liked to party and she probably had mid-range agreeableness and eroticism. Again, we don't know a lot to fill in all the different pieces of personality. A couple of other noteworthy items related to this case. In this case, we saw that there were over 60 confessions during the investigation and over 500 total. We don't know who did it, but we know that a lot of people wanted to take credit for it. Several of those who confessed were not born at the time when the murder took place, yet the police still had to listen to the whole confession. I wonder if that's a sign to like the newest person on the police force, right? Listening to somebody who could not have committed the crime confess for a few hours. Time traveling murders are the hardest to catch, especially considering that no one ever believes their confessions. There is no integrity in the false confession business anymore if people can do this. They should have taken a little pride in their work and only confessed to crimes that occurred when they were actually alive to commit the murder. If somebody is going to falsely confess, they at least have to get the basics right. Most people who did this probably did it for attention or because they had some type of reality testing problem like psychosis. But it made me wonder if they could use this to build a defense for a crime they did commit. Like if somebody falsely confessed to five or six murders and then actually committed a murder and then confessed to that one too, would they have actually built a defense, a way to get the confession thrown out? Like their lawyer could say, oh, that guy confesses to everything. You can't believe anything he says. I don't think it's a good strategy, but it just occurred to me that somebody could do that. They could think that over-confessing is the way to go. The other item I found noteworthy in this case was how it created a lot of business for the news media. The Los Angeles Record ran items related to the case on the front page consecutively for 31 days. So here we see a lot of information distortion. It's like people just want to know what happened, even if they're hearing misinformation. There's something intolerable about the mystery. People just want definitive answers. So again, they kind of entertain all this information being put out by the newspaper when it wasn't actually accurate. These types of newspapers are fairly predictable. The direction of the misinformation is always the same. The victim always becomes worse than they were. The details become more horrific, more unbelievable, more shocking. We just see a lot of sensationalism. Unfortunately, this was thought to have hampered the investigation, and this still happens in current times. We see that a lot of stories that are newsworthy get covered even more because of that sensationalistic component. So people look at that news coverage and think, well, if that's being covered more, that must mean that it's more important. So they pay more attention to it and it ends up causing this vicious cycle. So we see some cases don't get any attention and others get a lot of attention, even though a case like this, of course, was very difficult to solve and it never was solved. So all that coverage really did nothing. It's hard to imagine how misinformation can ever lead to a good result anyway. So those are my thoughts about the Black Dahlia murder. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.